All right, hi, and thanks everyone for being on today's webinar. Uh, my name is Rihanna Putnam, and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist for the Citizen Science Association. We're pleased today to be joined by Andrea Lorick Strauss, Amy Ranger, and Britt Forsberg of the University of Minnesota Extension, who will be presenting on a model of volunteer engagement that they developed to help um, improve retention and recruitment for citizen science volunteers. Um, like I mentioned, I have a few intro slides and I'll turn it over to our presenter shortly. The Citizen Science Association is a member-driven organization that connects people from a wide range of experiences around a shared purpose of advancing knowledge through research and monitoring done by, for, and with members of the public. This work takes place in almost every discipline and requires a wide range of skills. Our efforts are concentrated into a biennial conference. Uh, we've already been receiving proposals for our next one in 2021. We have an open source peer reviewed journal. We also have member services such as our working groups, some online networking tools and webinars like these. A bit about our membership. Um, our membership represents the multidisciplinary and multidimensional nature of the field. We have wide representation in project leaders, researchers, and evaluators, and a growing number of individuals um, that represent or that are doing community science in their own areas. Membership benefits include things like conference discounts, monthly newsletters, voting and board elections, and a growing number of online networking opportunities. Organizational members like uh, UMN Extension and Starter a few weeks ago also have the opportunity to present skills-based webinars. Membership aligns and supports the association mission, and we encourage you to join or renew. Um, we have details on our website. The link is on the screen. Our working groups are also regularly do webinars for the CSA. Last week, our ethics working group did a webinar in a series on ethical issues that they began last year. And we're looking to start a series this fall with our research and evaluation group who will be doing um, a few webinars on that topic. Our working groups are one of the ways that we advance the goals of the CSA through the sharing of resources, best practices, and relevant information, both among group members and also to the broader citizen science community. Working groups all have individual web pages that you can find through this link that's on the screen now. Um, you can find details on how to get involved. Um, and they also, a lot of them have resource guides that have a lot of really useful information. So be sure to check that out. You can find our webinars um, online on our YouTube channel um, linked on the screen. Um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar sometime next week. Um, and so if you want to reference back, you can find it there. Um, we look forward to growing the content available on YouTube this fall with more webinars, um, and it is something that we're looking to really expand, so be sure to subscribe if that's something you want to keep up with. Lastly, we do expect quite a few people on the call today, and we have everyone in listen-only mode to help keep background noise to a minimum. We encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat, say where you're from, what kind of projects you work on. Um, the chat is also where we'll ask you to direct any questions for our presenters. Um, we have three presenters today, and so they'll be monitoring the chat and we'll be able to answer your questions um, as, as they pop up, and there will also be some time for Q&A at the end. Um, and so, yeah, you can use, use it that way. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our host. Thank you all again. I'm really looking forward to this. And yeah, thanks. There we go. All right. Very good. Thank you so much, Rihanna. I'm going to sit now share my screen. Uh, we have a kind of a lot of moving parts on this presentation today with three different presenters and some polls and a presentation. And we hope that y'all will have some forbearance for us. Uh, I just lost one of my screens. But <laughs> the important one, I have all of you and I don't have the chat. So I'm going to work on that when it's not my turn to present. Okay, there we go. If uh, somebody's <laughs> going to tell me if you can't see what you're supposed to see, Amy or Britt. So uh, like Rihanna said, thank you for being here. Um, we at the University of Minnesota Extension have a really nice uh, collaborative effort between our citizen science efforts and our Minnesota Master Naturalist Volunteer Training Program. And so we have worked really hard to crack the nut about what engages volunteers, what helps them to feel meaning in their work, and what helps them to stay around, what helps them to want to come in the first place. We're not perfect. We've learned a few things. And uh, we sort of made a flow chart, a model um, of what we think works and what we think happens over the the course of the volunteer experience and so that is what we're going to talk about today. So uh, we would like you to tell us a little bit more about who you are by filling out a few polls that Rihanna is going to bring up. 
And so now is a good time for that. Yeah, I've totally lost my screen. So there we are. So while you are completing these polls, um, please uh, also fill in the chat again. If you haven't introduced yourself, tell us your any citizen science project you may work on and what affiliation you have. Many of you have done that. Um, this is really helpful to us. We won't necessarily be able to chat back with every single per, uh, chat uh, participant, but we'll be able to save the chat. And so we'll be able to look that over later um, and we'll be able to share that with you. So a couple times over the course of the presentation, we're gonna ask you to um, make some notes in the chat based on what the presentation has been saying. And so uh, we'll try to comment on that as much as we can but um, also later on, you'll all be able to look back at the chat and see the comments made by others. Uh, and then that's one way that we'll all be able to learn from each other. So uh, please again, fill out the poll. I'm gonna fill out the poll on my screen so it'll go away, submit, okay. Oh, all right, well, there you have it. While we're, everyone's filling out the poll also, I want my uh, colleagues to introduce themselves. Again, I'm Andrea, University of Minnesota Extension. Um, I'm based in Rochester, Minnesota, but Amy and Britt are elsewhere. So Amy, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Rager. I'm uh, with the University of Minnesota. I am housed at the West Central Research and Outreach Station, which is uh, about 150 miles west and north of the Twin Cities. Uh, it's quite rural here, and I am also the state program director for Minnesota Master Nationalists. Great. Now, Britt, go ahead. Sure, I'm Britt Forsberg, a program coordinator with University of Minnesota Extension, and so I manage one entire citizen science project studying the distribution and diversity of native bees. So with about 150 volunteers each field season, um, we're looking at what bee species we have, where they live in Minnesota. I handle all the outreach, volunteer recruitment, volunteer training, um, logistical support, that sort of thing. Thank you. I hope I don't uh, distract everyone with me trying to find the rest of my screens back. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we're, we're making it up as we go. Okay, so I, uh, Brianna, I don't know if everyone is able to see the results. Shall I announce them as, or can everyone see them? Looks like we have uh, quite a few program coordinators. Uh, some folks are newer to working with volunteers. Oh, look, there's the chat. Hooray. Um, I still didn't appear. Hmm. Uh, some people are newer to volunteer work and some of you have quite a bit of experience working with volunteers. The whole, the whole gamut, that's exciting. I hope we can all benefit from um, each other's experience and knowledge. Um, and uh, how, how many volunteers are active in your program each year? 100 to 500 folks in the most programs. We have some smaller programs and some larger programs. So that's really fascinating. It's good to know what kind of a spectrum of folks we have. Uh, in the room. So thank you for that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and dive in here to the presentation, right? Don't click the wrong way. So we already did the introductions. Very good. And what we want you to remember at the end of this presentation is that working with volunteers requires this magical coming together of three different pieces. The simultaneous meeting of the needs of both the staff the organization and the volunteers. So if anybody, if any one party gets their needs met, it's no good if the others have not had their needs met. Of course, we also as professionals need to understand why volunteers come in the first place. Why do they contribute their time? And then realize that just as soon as we have them all figured out, volunteer needs change, their motivations change, their life situations change. And so it's an ever moving target uh, that we're continually trying to balance. So in order to get our heads around all of this in Minnesota, we have made what we call the master volunteer life cycle. By master, we don't mean they're experts. Um, master references our, for example, Minnesota Master Naturalist Program, maybe your Master Garden Programs. It's these volunteer programs which you, most people wouldn't be able to walk in off the street and just do. It requires some preparation, it requires some training, uh, a few skills, uh, that in order to be successful at the volunteer task, it requires uh, some, some advanced work. It's not like taking tickets or, you know, serving beverages. It, you need a little more preparation. So that's why we think citizen science fits into this concept of master volunteers. Again, often it requires some, some skills and practice uh, before volunteers are able to really engage with it. But what we want you to notice about this model is that there are three phases, we think, in the volunteer's career of volunteering with your program. There's the recruiting phase, this is the entry level, uh, what brings people in and gets them ready to volunteer. 
Then there's the volunteering phase and some, co some components we believe really contribute to the successful volunteer experience. And then assessing, uh, taking stock, evaluating what's going on so that hopefully volunteers can uh, reflect and re-engage and continue volunteering for the long term. So what we're gonna do is take one, each phase one at a time. I'm gonna take the first phase and Amy's gonna talk about the second, Britt's gonna talk about the third. Um, you're welcome to post questions during uh, our different spiels. Uh, we'll be sure to look closely for questions also at the end. In case uh, you're thinking, oh, I gotta scribble this, you know, flow chart down, there's too many pieces, don't worry about it. Uh, there is an, uh, a little write-up that describes this model and explains it and gives you the picture in the journal called the Journal of Extension. And so I believe the link to it was in the, pre the program description, the webinar advertisement, uh, but we'll also send it out again afterwards so that you can, you know, share it with others in your organization or remember all these uh, things that we're saying. So I'm gonna dive in and start talking, just take a close look at that recruiting phase. And what I want you to really keep in mind is that volunteers come to the volunteer experience for a whole bunch of different reasons. You know, volunteers, the other things, what else could they be doing with their time? They could be watching TV, they could be hanging out with their family, they could be watching their kid play soccer, they could be volunteering for another organization. So understanding what brings them to the door is really important. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, but also realizing too that adults come to the volunteer uh, opportunity with some life experience. They may be really good at some skill. They may have been told that they're not good at things. Uh, they may be comfortable outdoors or fearful outdoors or comfortable with computers or not, you know, I mean, whatever. They've got all different life experiences that they bring to that situation. And so as programs, we need to think about that and, and figure out how to understand what they bring to the experience and how, how, what to do about that. There's recruiting them. We use a variety of different messages that draw on those motivations and that experience that attracts them to the opportunity. In the master volunteer experience, there is an education component. In our case, uh, many times there's a, like a training on, for example, the protocols of the Citizen Science Project or a full-blown master naturalist course, 40 hours of training about the experience. Many people come to this volunteer educational opportunity and that's all they wanted. Or they get there and realize, whoa, this isn't for me for whatever reason. And they may exit the volunteer experience and that's okay. It's maybe better for them to self-select out than to be putting themselves in a difficult situation. So lots of times I hear citizen science program leaders complain that volunteers show up and then they don't come back. Well, um, there's a reason for that and we need to understand that. Sometimes it's because we didn't meet whatever motivated them. Maybe it's because their education or their experience wasn't aligned with this opportunity for whatever reason. Uh, but again, we, we educate them, we help them understand the nature of our citizen science project, our goals, all of that, and understand the, in our case, the natural resource uh, you know, concepts around the work that we're doing. And then people are ready to actually volunteer realizing in our case, uh, sometimes the volunteer will approach an organization with an offer of help, and sometimes an organization will put out the all call for volunteers. That's why uh, both are listed there in that sort of yellow gold color. Uh, it can go either way, but one of the things to remember though is that we can lead the horse to water, but we cannot force them to drink. They have to do take some effort to, you know, get in the car or get online or show up to that volunteer opportunity. We can help them feel prepared. We can have adapted to whatever they need, uh, but they do need to take the initiative to, to become engaged with that opportunity. So we're going to talk a little bit more about why volunteers volunteer with our first, well, our, our, our next poll. I want you to think about why do you volunteer? What is it that would bring you to be uh, you know, a citizen science volunteer or a scout leader or a swimming instructor or a, a trail crew or a ticket taker. What, wh why do you show up to volunteer? So go ahead and take that poll and submit it and we'll see the results here in a second. I wonder if I can scroll ahead and see the results when they come. So Rihanna, you go ahead and post those results when you're ready. As we talk about understanding volunteer motivation, we have looked back on human motivation theory 
uh, that comes from the 1950s. Why is it that people do what they do? And Atkinson and McClelland have uh, some well-established research that says that people volunteer for three reasons. To, for any of not just volunteer, but they do anything. They get up in the morning, they, they get dressed because they have drives to achieve things, to feel affiliation, and to feel power or influence in the world. And so we're gonna look at that as how can we use these? Oh good, see, here we go. Why do you volunteer? Many people want to make a difference. See, they want to achieve something. They wanna influence the world. That's great, even this group uh, appeals to that. It has been a surprise to me in my career how much learning is a part of volunteer work, and I love that. And this group reinforces that many people agree that they want to learn something as part of their volunteering, and we have sure seen that in our Minnesota Master Naturalist program. Um, I love that all of these have strong responses because that's what we're going to say here next is that volunteers uh, show up for all these different reasons. So let's take the first one first. What we're gonna do is talk about each of these. Well, if I could get, there we go. Uh, okay, so let's talk about achievement. How can we use appeals around achievement to help people be attracted to our citizen science volunteer opportunities? We know that people want to feel that they've accomplished something in life, that they have, maybe that means they've learned something, that they've made a difference and that they have a little recognition. This is why certificates of participation are a thing. People wanna know that they they accomplished something. Um, what we've done is we've looked at, there we go, um, maybe some appeals that you could use in your promotion. Uh, so on the right hand are some tips that you could use to appeal to people's interest in achievement when you recruit your volunteers. Uh, but by way of a story, I just want to point out something that we do in our Minnesota Master Naturalist program that is so um, motivating for people, and that is that we give them pins when they've earned them. So when you complete your initial training, uh, you get a pin that reflects the biome of our state that your training was about. And so that, they wear that pin and that shows they've graduated from a class, they finished something, they accomplished it. Uh, we also, uh, when they complete their uh, hours, their 40 hours of service in a year, which is the minimum we ask them to do in order to maintain um, active, be considered active in the program, they get a pin for each year and so that, that they complete those hours. And so we have our volunteers walking around with a hat or a vest that's got all their pins on them and they are super proud. Oh, look, Amy's showing them on her camera. There we go. They're super proud of those pins. They earned each one and it means something to them. That's a recognition that has a signal to others in our group that other people understand and recognize. Um, but even if you can't, if you're not gonna give them a pin, maybe you'll help them see, look, we started at you know, data point number 100 and we made it to 250. We accomplished that today, folks. Thank you for doing that. And then they feel like they've done something. On an invasive species project, maybe we cleared this acre. Look, from that flag post to this flag post, that wasn't done when you arrived, folks, and now it's finished. Good job, us. To feel like we, as opposed to a giant task of, you know, classifying 10,000 photos for a citizen science project. That's overwhelming and my little 10 photos didn't help, but it does because we went from 50 pictures to 100 pictures that are done now and are useful to science. So helping people see where they've accomplished something, they've finished something, they've, they've done something that made a difference, that's helpful to helping people feel motivated to want to come back. Then we're gonna move on to our next um, motivation that people feel of anything, and I'll explain it, but then um, I'm gonna ask Amy to tell a quick story. But again, people wanna feel that they're part of something larger than themselves. They wanna feel that they are affiliated with an organization they respect, that they are in the know, that they're kind of a behind the scenes group. They wanna be with people who are like them. And so they wanna find their tribe. And we know that people sign up for many of our programs because they wanna learn something, but in the end they say, yeah, I learned something, but the best part about it is that I met these awesome, amazing people. And that is what makes them want to come back too. But Amy's got some good stories about this. Here, there you go. Okay, so um, I teach class um, on one of our Metro campuses and what we try to do in the class is expose them to really interesting researchers who are part of the university. So two weeks ago, we had a really fun opportunity where a researcher called and he said, I'm studying these freshwater mussels and I have some mussels that we need to milk, which means we're going to stimulate them to release their glochidia. 
Okay, muscles are often a critter that people don't think much about. Lots of people don't know lots about them. Our students were so excited. We got to go to the lab. We got to, we called it tickle the muscles and watch her release her glochidia. Then we collected the glochidia. And under microscopes, these 22 students picked apart all the individual little baby muscles. And then he, um, were, he's actually doing real live research at that moment. They're not sure in Minnesota which fish, fish are the best hosts for the glochidia. So he had tubs of four different minnows. And the students in the Master Naturalist class actually got to infest the fish with the glochidia. And then um, he's been sending me weekly updates and turns out the students, even after the class is done, are going back every week to help him count how many glochidia have actually used the host fish, which host fish they chose, which they didn't. And they're gonna publish a paper together in the fall as part of his real scientific research. So that's, I mean, so they are in love with Mark Hovey. I mean, he is the rock star in their world. So that's a really great way for people like us who have opportunities to turn people on to these cool researchers who do cool projects that often go unnoticed. So. So muscle research is really important to 22 new people in Minnesota. <laughs> and the researcher probably thought, no one cares about my project. And the volunteers didn't know how cool it was. But now the researcher knows them. They know the researcher. And they're part of something special. Love it. Love it. Thank you. I'm remembering, too, uh, in terms of recognition, uh, the time when one of our citizen science programs, instead of having a dinner or giving gifts to the volunteers, just invited them into the lab to see what is done with the data the volunteers collect. Boy, was that special. People came out of the woodwork for that, and just it was a really special, fun opportunity because they felt like part of something and they wanted to see what they had done. All right, a third reason why the research says people volunteer is so that they can feel power in the world. Again, they want to influence others. They want to make a difference in the world and change the course of our future. So Britt's got some good stories about that. Go ahead, Britt. Sure, and some of this depends on your citizen science project area. As a reminder, again, I work with native bees. And if you have noticed, if you pay attention at all, they're in the news all the time. Um, have gotten quite a bit of attention for declining populations and concerns. Um, so that's a big motivator to have people involved in, a, in this project. So I'd just like to read a quote from one of our um, year-end evaluations. And when I asked the question, what interested you in participating in this project? I eat fruits and vegetables. I'm a mom. I want to have a healthy world for my kids to grow up in. I want my kids to see me taking an active role in helping to improve our world so that they will do so as well. I realize that without bees, this may not happen. So participating in the project, helping scientists learn more about the native bees we have um, was really influential for her family, for her living out the values of her life. Love it. Helping people connect with those big picture reasons for the research in the first place is very inspiring then for people to feel like it really does matter if I show up or not, or if I come back to this volunteer tax, because I'm, I'm making this world a better place. And in today's world when challenges can feel overwhelming, giving them that little piece of power, um, that makes it worth getting up in the morning. Great. Well, we took a look also at some other research more recent uh, from volunteer perspective, a report of uh, industry highlights about volunteer activity. And, and here's what they say people have reasons for volunteering. Uh, they say that volunteers report, volunteer because they want to contribute to a cause they care about. Again, they like to have the power and the affiliation with the cause. People volunteer because they want to improve their community. Uh, they, again, want to feel power. They, people want to do something they're interested in. Again, that's that learning and achievement. People want to socialize, again, to just be with what their, their family or their team or their book club or their church group. Uh, and so what the volunteer task doesn't matter as much is that they're doing something with their group. Uh, to uh, People volunteer because they want to build skills in a new area and maybe for career opportunities, again, number six, to enhance their resume. Uh, sometimes volunteering is mandatory, and then I'm not sure we call that volunteering, but in any case, uh, even family related, you're just helping out your, your cousin or your mom or whatever. Uh, again, you wanna be part of something you want to affiliate. Whether we're talking about achievement, affiliation and power, or the more uh, parsed out uh, descriptions of volunteering here that we have on this slide, 
we guess that participants in this webinar will have done uh, used some of these appeals in your research. And so let's kind of wrap up this motivation, uh, this recruiting section and talk about, I think we have a poll for this also, what have you done? Uh, what appeals have you used around your appealing for volunteers? So have you used any of these in your appeals? But I also want to encourage you to use the chat uh, to talk about any specific examples you might have. Again, we won't have time to talk about all of these, but uh, we'd sure like to have you document any examples you'd like to offer in the chat so that later when we share the chat, we can all read through it and, and get the brilliance of this group. So please feel free to uh, enter your chats, enter your polls, uh, your poll responses. Um, I bet, can you answer more? Yeah, you can only answer once. All right, there you go. And I see the chat has pulled up, life is good. Yeah, so please go ahead and enter uh, any comments you have about um, what you have used in terms of motivation uh, to appeal to your volunteers. We also are interested in any other, uh, for example, examples of how you've used motivations to match people to volunteer tasks, um, that kind of thing, recruitment messages in general. Oh, look, Rihanna put a link to the article. Fantastic. Look at that, we've got some great examples. All right, so please, please, please do enter your examples and stories even. Uh, this is a way we learn from each other. So I'm gonna let you keep working on that, but I am gonna move the presentation forward and move on to that next phase in our model where we look at the middle of our chart, the volunteering phase. And Amy's gonna talk about that. I'm gonna advance slides, so uh, we're gonna work on this. Go ahead, Amy. Okay, so um, the results are up for the poll. So why do people volunteer? It looks like uh, the biggest reason in our group today is because uh, to contribute to a cause that people care about. I, um, that was me as well. Um, so that is an important reason. Again, it fits into our model of why we want to get people here. So when people come to volunteer opportunities, we have to look at these things and make sure we're meeting their needs. So we have to make sure we're clear about the cause that they're going to contribute to. So that's what we want you to know when you think about uh, recruiting and why people volunteer and what they might get out of coming to your site. So we close the poll. Yeah, thank you, okay. Okay, now that we've talked about recruiting people and we've basically got them in the door and we've provided that, in our case, we provide 40 hours of education about Minnesota's natural and cultural history. Um, then we want to think about now they're like ready to go. They're, they're raring, they're chomping at the bit. So what are we going to do with them? So our, our box continues down to the volunteer. The yellow circle in the center is the human being volunteer. So there are four areas that we want to think about now that we have them trained and they're ready to be a volunteer, how are we going to keep them happy and get them having a good successful experience in the volunteer world? So let's start out with the first one that we're going to go to is train. So the first thing we need to do now is train them specifically to orient them to the organization. Uh, so what, what do you do if you're, if you're volunteering at a nature center or if you're coming into a particular project, if they're going to volunteer at the University of Minnesota, they need to know a little bit about the university. What do we stand for? What do we believe in? What kind of job do we do in the community? What, where do we fit in? So orient them there first. The next thing, and it's very important, is specific job training. Uh, we would suggest that you have a job description for each position that you're going to have for a volunteer. Very specific, just like your job description in your job, in your actual professional work. You know, what is the title? And give them a meaningful title. Don't just have them be um, volunteer pencil sharpener, because that's not very exciting, right? I mean, turns out, you know, you can think of some lovely names and some other creative things, but there are probably jobs that are similar that are paid positions. So think about what you call those and use the same sort of respectful language when you're writing a position description for your volunteers. 
The third thing that we want to talk about a little bit here is advanced training. Remember that one of the reasons volunteers come to your organization is because they're seeking knowledge and information. So a reward for them that's also training, so it's a, it's a two birds with one stone here thing is, if you could provide them advanced training, give them, ex give them advanced skills to do the job about your organization, right? So this is that, if you remember back to the very beginning, those three keys, this is a win-win for the person, the organization, um, and, and all of the trifecta comes together here when you can provide advanced training that's going to lead them into uh, further opportunities for volunteering. The next box is to support volunteers. This is really important. Once we get volunteers in, uh, they're, they're very motivated, they're often very skilled, but they need support. You cannot just turn them loose and hope it works out. This will not go well for you and it could be your worst nightmare. I have to say that the volunteers we turn out of the Minnesota Master Naturalist Program are really gung-ho, which is great, but sometimes if you manage volunteers, you know that's a little tough too. They are really demanding, they expect a lot, and they love you. So sometimes we love things and people to death. So it's best if we can support them with clear job descriptions again, what is the position they've been asked to do? What are the resources available to them? For example, I mean, really even where, where do I hang my coat? Uh, is there coffee for me in the break room? Can I use the copy machine? What other tools are available on site? If I'm gonna be doing gardening, where are the gardening tools kept? How do I clean them? How do I put them away? Be very specific and help them know what you expect of them and how they are to accomplish their task. They will feel better and perform better if they know what, what the deal is. Which leads into communication. Communication is super important. You have to be very clear about what it is the task is, what your expectation is. If you expect them to be there at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, be clear that it's 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Don't make them think that, oh, it doesn't matter when this task gets done as long as it's done by Friday. If you have expectations, lay them out very clearly. And the last thing in the support area is feedback. Think of volunteers just like you think of other paid employees. You have a performance review every year. You need to take some time and sit down with volunteers and talk to them about how's it going, you know? Joel, you're doing a great job collecting that data and it's really helping move our project forward and we appreciate that. But if you could tweak this one little area, that would make the stuff we're collecting even better. Try to give them that feedback loop and allow them to, to communicate with you to say, um, I need more information from you about this and how do I get that? So create that open space and opportunity for communication and feedback in a loop. The next area is connecting. This appeals to those people who like to affiliate. They love to affiliate with experts and organizations. Now, I, I can tell you there's lots of awesome stories about affiliating and funny things, uh, especially at the university. Think about all the people that you work with in whatever field you work with who are really the rock stars about the thing they know. Like I think about um, Karen Oberhauser worked with us for a long time. Many of you know Karen through the Citizen Science Association, and she's the monarch, you know, guru in the world. And so when we could tote Karen Oberhauser to an event and say, look, this is Karen Oberhauser and she's the monarch queen. Everybody loves that. They want to, they want to shake her hand. They want to get to know her. So if you have folks like that in your organization, you know, trot them out occasionally and talk about how awesome they are because they are awesome and they probably don't get a pat on the back. Very awesome either. There are other, also these communities of interest that exist. So what we're finding, for example, the photo we have here is a, another program in Minnesota we offer called AIS Detectors. And they go out and look for aquatic invasive species, but they also do plant ID and are recording things in iNaturalist. So help them find the, their peeps in the world they're interested in. So if they're really interested in keeping the lake where their cabin is clean and healthy, Help them connect with those groups, and that, again, will help them to feel connected to the bigger project and the bigger term outcomes. Next slide. Okay, and recognizing. Now, I showed you my little pins earlier, um, and we do formal and informal recognition in our program. 
Um, it's shocking these days where we don't get mail in our mailbox anymore, how meaningful a written thank you note is. Um, so we actually handwrite a lot of thank you notes for a lot of things because, you know, the only mail in your mailbox is, you know, junk mail or things you don't really care about. So when you get a nice handwritten note now, you pay attention to that, right? And go, wow, somebody took time to write that. They didn't just send me an email. So I would recommend that's a great cheap way to do it. Um, and there can be formal ways of doing this at a banquet, at a program, or it could be just saying, hey, Joe in the hallway, great work today. You did a spectacular job out there collecting this information, doing this task, and I'm super glad you're here. We couldn't get this done without you. And that's really important. And the last thing on the recognize bullet is culturally important. Now, this means culturally in a couple of ways. Of course, it's culturally talking about ethnically making sure it's appropriate for the people. But it's also culturally important knowing where you live. In Minnesota, for example, we asked our master naturalists at our annual conference, would you like a lot of pomp and circumstance and you want to have everybody march up on the stage and we can say, look, they did a thousand hours, everybody jazz hands. And Minnesotans said, no, we do not want that. In Minnesota, we're, we're you know, um, we're a little passive aggressive, kind of quiet, a uh, little shy sometimes. So people don't really want to always stand up and be recognized. There are certainly people who do. But overall, people said no. They would rather just have their name printed and it be up on a bulletin board in the hallway. That was enough recognition for them. So again, making sure you understand the people you're working with and what is most appropriate for them in the way that they wish to be recognized. Okay. So this is the center of our model. Remember, now we're in the volunteering phase. The human is the yellow person. Now I want you to think about, we're gonna put up another poll, and I want you to think about what do you do to foster volunteering? How do you train, connect, support, recognize? And then what could you do to volunteer in this phase? So you're gonna, uh, Rihanna has a poll, she'll put up. I think it's just in the chat box. Okay, just post it in the chat box, please. So tell us what, what do you do and how could you do it? Because I bet this group is already doing some things to support their volunteers, to recognize them. You probably have a clever idea about connections you've made. Um, we'd love to hear all of that. So take a minute, everybody type something, um, and then that is a great way to contribute to each other. Now maybe we need to play the music. Do, 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 do. Please write something. Okay. We don't. <laughs> okay. I don't see a lot of chats coming in, people. Come on, we need you. All right. While you do that, oh look, free tickets. Okay, go ahead. Keep. We're gonna keep. We're gonna keep rolling, but that'll give you time to type some stuff. Um, now we're gonna talk about this assessing phase, and uh, Britt's gonna do that. Yeah, great. Thank you. So uh, you can't just say that you've gotten your volunteers, you've trained them, sent them off to their jobs, and you're done, right? Um, it may not be the best fit for that volunteer. It may not be the best fit for the organization. And what you're looking at is having this great meeting of the minds where you're meeting the volunteers' needs as well as the staff and organization's needs. So making sure that you are reflecting on this experience yourself as well as soliciting feedback from your volunteers. Because uh, it could be that your volunteer needs to uh, change their role. Something else has happened in their lives. Within the Master Naturalist program, there are a lot of volunteers who are empty nesters. Uh, a number of volunteers early on in their environmental careers, but very few volunteers with kids at home. Right? They have a limited number of hours and ways that they can spend their time. Uh, and so committing 40 hours a year just might not be the right thing at that time for them. It doesn't mean that they had a bad experience, doesn't mean they don't like your organization, don't agree with your mission, um, just that the time is not right. So you could take some time talking with your volunteers. Uh, maybe everything is great. They'd like to continue in that role. They're enjoying themselves. Um, could be they want a new role, which is either more or less responsibility. Uh, in my project, it's pretty common for people to take on a small piece. And then as they've taken on one year, all right, well, I learned a lot about stem nesting bees. You know what, this year I'd like to work even harder and I want to learn more about bumblebees. And so they're adding these additional volunteer hours as well as project and responsibility areas. It might mean that that volunteer needs to step away for a little while 
deal with some other things. Maybe there's burnout, uh, or it might be the right choice for that volunteer to leave. Oh yeah, sorry. You, you, you <laughs> talked about these things. I always I had one. Wow, I had one slide. That's weird. No, that's fine. Turns out you weren't reading my mind from 100 miles away. How is that possible, Andrea? No, right. But you won't get that feedback if you don't ask for it. That's what she said. Okay, so now we're back to the chat box again. Go ahead. Sure. So thinking about this assessment phase, and this could be a formal or informal. It could be that you've sent out an evaluation. You've asked them to record comments. It could be that you just ask when you walk in in the morning, how are things going? Um, do you need anything else from me to make this a productive volunteer opportunity? Um, so let's add in the chat then, what are things that you do to foster that reflection? Or what are ideas that you have you maybe haven't implemented yet? And then I think we should take some time to read because it's looking like, like there have been a lot of comments coming. A lot of great stuff coming in. So we have a number of great examples of the um, things while people are volunteering in terms of recognition or uh, nominations for awards or special experiences, um, get, looking for getting more feedback, volunteer party, free parking passes. Who hates parking, paying for parking? Oh, everybody, that's great. Um, volunteer of the month, I love thank you cards. I do get a, a, a thank you card from an organization I volunteer for, but it's just a pre-printed thing. It's like they paid a mail house to do it and I'm like, no, you could at least sign this thing. So uh, connecting phase, bringing in experts to make the trips more interesting. Okay, helping people see how that local researcher uses their data. God bless America. We know the research says people, our volunteers want to hear about how these data are used. Good stuff, good stuff. There's an all call for a question. If everybody's seen projects on herpetology that have evaluated the engagement of volunteers. So if anybody knows about that, please feel free to chime in on the chat box with an answer there. Focused on herps. Yeah, Minnesota has a herp mapper project. You can Google that. Surveying the volunteers, lunch and learns, all of that's good stuff. It looks like a couple of times opportunities to engage directly with the researcher or scientist have come up. Mm -hmm. Even as an introvert, I would like that. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so talking a little bit about volunteer trends, this data is coming from the Minnesota Association for Volunteer Administration. Uh, they survey volunteers in lots of different content areas every year. Uh, but so being aware of what's going on so that when maybe a volunteer leaves, uh, you don't have to take it personally, right? There are all these different things going on in volunteers' lives. Uh, it may or may not be related to how you provided the opportunity, but you being aware of it helps you provide the range of opportunities that will be attractive to more volunteers. So again, uh, just like we saw when we took a poll of all the people on this webinar, you know, people want to know that they're making a difference. If they don't feel like they're making a difference, they may not stay with that volunteer opportunity. Uh, the desire to learn. Short-term opportunities is a growing field where no one is saying, I am ready to come every Monday all year long for multiple years. Um, often they want to experience different opportunities. So having a short-term allows them to work on different areas. Um, having a beginning and end to a project. So it's easy to know when that starts, when it's okay to move on. Flexible scheduling. Um, I think more and more people are balancing volunteering with work or families, all these other things to work around with. Uh, group opportunities. So there are more and more companies who are allowing uh, their employees to take time to volunteer. And sometimes that's planning that everybody within that corporation has an opportunity to go. So I've done a number of events. Uh, we have General Mills headquartered quartered near St. Paul. And they have a great tradition of encouraging their employees to volunteer, but then they want opportunities that are physically on their site that take very little time away from their employees workday, uh, but still support their mission. And then um, building relationships, which I would say in my project has been huge where now I have people who I've worked with for several years, who it doesn't actually matter now what I ask them to do, but they will come and do it because I asked them. 
because they have a relationship with me, they know that I appreciate them, they know what they do matters. And so I may have been that they started out being interested in bees, but now they'll come to the lab and they will help pin insects or they will help me glue wood blocks, you know, very low, uh, low skill, not necessarily fun opportunities, but again, they know that what they do matters um, and feel appreciated. On that. All right, so this would be an opportunity for folks if you want to post a question. Again, we've talked about these three phases of a volunteer's life cycle with your program, the uh, recruiting phase, the volunteering phase, and the assessing phase. Um, we uh, have the article, I think someone linked to it in the chat, so thank you for that. If anybody wants to remember what we said, <laughs> if that's helpful. Um, but we'd really be open to any specific questions, any uh, challenging volunteer uh, episodes you've experienced, and if anybody in the group has advice for uh, each other about how to handle it. Um, other tips um, for other questions, other problem spots or opportunities for working with volunteers. So we're gonna give you a second to fill in the chat um, so that we can take some time with that. Um, if you want to talk with us one-on-one, -on -one, we're certainly, certainly happy to do that. Um, we, your, our email addresses are right here in the slide, so feel free to uh, copy that down if you like. Um, I'm looking in the chat for some questions. Look, it's like some exchanging of resources in there. Thank you. Um, sharing resources with each other. Look, you can view this uh, person's survey about the amphibians. Don't complete the survey, but have a look at it. And we're talking yeah. about herps, not herbs. Yeah. <laughs> Different. Let's talk about where people post their volunteer opportunities <laughs> to get people interested in the first place. We use Facebook meetups, websites, etc. cetera. Um, Amy, do you want to take that? It's, I'm saying, I'm curious. Where does everyone post? <laughs> okay, so in Minnesota, we use Constant Contact. Um, we have a blog and we use Constant Contact to drive people to our blog posts. So every Friday, I send an email that says like remember to go look at the blog and these are the new highlights for the week and all of the volunteer opportunities from around the state get sent to me because they know that I synthesize them and I drive them there. We also have a super active Facebook page, um, short term volunteer like if someone says to me oh Amy I forgot and I need volunteers on Saturday I'd post that on Facebook it'll go on the blog too but the short term things go there. Um, we have not used meetup I thought about it but we haven't. Um, I don't use Twitter. That's just a, I am 51 and I don't like Twitter thing How about that. If we had a young, exciting person who wanted to tweet all the time, that'd be good with me. Um, but we do use other social media platforms. We, um, my 14 year old daughter tells me I have a killer Instagram account. So I think that means I probably have a pretty good one, uh, but it's totally run by a volunteer, not by me. So again, I would really take full advantage of social media and, um, you know, pl programs like Constant Contact to get the message out to everyone. I think that for older volunteers especially, they, they'll they have an email address, but they may not have signed up for the email lists that you want them on. And so we're, I'm starting to think about how else can we market outside of the electronic venues? And, you know, it, it involves tabling. We have volunteers who do some tabling for us at events like uh, County Fair or Audubon Society events or whatever, trying to get our brochures out there to recruit people to like our Facebook page in the first place or to, to take a class or to get in the door in the first place. And then so they'll see our, you know, our blog that lists all those volunteer opportunities. Um, giving presentations at these, you know, like-minded groups is another way I, maybe we can direct some volunteers to do those so that we can get more people in the door in the first place. I think that th that's sort of a two-tiered question. One is, you know, getting people in the door in the first place. And the second tier is the getting people to involved with new tasks or new opportunities or, you know, to keep, to actually report the data they collected, you know, that kind of thing. Britt, you maybe have some. Yeah, so working with other organizations has been pretty key. And so, I mean, there are lots of county natural resource departments or nature centers who have 
space, right? They have lands, they would like to know more about them. They don't have the time, the expertise to do all those surveys. And so if I can come in with protocols and um, directions for this, they're very happy to reach out to their audiences and find the people they already know who live nearby, who might work on site, who may already volunteer with their organization and give them the opportunity to participate in my citizen science project. Uh, the other is to think about your organization as a whole. I am the only full-time staff member with Minnesota Bee Alice, but I'm part of the University of Minnesota Extension. I'm part of the University of Minnesota. Uh, so there are all these people I can talk to who know communities where I might not be familiar with them, um, who are able to help get that message out. Trying to use a multi-pronged effort for sure. I think too, working through the platforms like were mentioned here, SciStarter and perhaps Zooniverse, uh, and, and you then benefit from all of their outreach to recruit new audiences. And if your project is set up within one of those platforms, then any new volunteer who comes to that platform is exposed to your program and your opportunities. And so uh, that is really convenient then for you as well. All right, we're, we're open to other questions or other uh, comments that people wanna make. Again, we'll hang around until uh, at least two, potentially after. Uh, but again, feel free to post your volunteer engagement dilemmas um, uh, in the chat and we'll stay around and, and look at those. But I want to just remind you to think about the volunteers who engage with your program as on a life course of volunteering and how can you meet them on the journey that they're on? How can you appeal to the mo things which motivate them and help them see how participation in your pro program is superior to the other opportunities they have for spending their time, like watching Netflix or you know whatever else <laughs> they might be doing. So help them see that spending time with your program is worth their investment, uh, appeal to their drives for achievement, affiliation, and power, um, and then uh, treat them well when they come, provide them with the support and the connections and the feedback, help them think about whether this opportunity continues to be meaningful for them or they'd like to try something new, and, and recognize your volunteers in every way you can think of. Know them by name when possible, um, know what they've done, what they've contributed, and um, help them see where they fit into the big picture and all of those will help you to be successful. So that's a wrap up. I think we'll um, thank everyone for coming. And again, we'll hang around and keep answering questions informally. Uh, but again, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and insight in the chat. You can look forward to an email that will come from Rihanna. We are gonna stay around and address these couple questions that have just come in. But Rihanna, if you have any closing comments? Sure, yeah. Um, thank you guys so much, this was really, a great webinar. Um, the webinar has been recorded and I'll share the recording. Um, I'll give you a link to our YouTube channel and an email that'll come out tomorrow along with a transcript of the chat. Um, and you can find the um, direct link for the recording. Um, I'll share it on Twitter once that's live. It takes us a few days to get the to get the recording out of the cloud and uploaded. And so it'll probably be late next week or early the following um, with the holiday next week. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, if, if you have any last minute questions, feel free to ask them um, and our presenters will stick around for a few more minutes. Awesome. I want to take on this uh, question about uh, training versus not training. We referenced a 40 hour class. So who goes through that training? That's not for all the citizen science volunteers. Amy, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, uh, I just sent him a private email too. So we provide 40 hours of training to the people who register and take our course. And they are trained in Minnesota natural and ecological history uh, with a little bit of human impacts in there too. Um, and then they asked if those volunteer opportunities were limited. Some volunteer opportunities are only for master naturalists. Um, typically, we'll have some university researchers that really want someone who has like a base of ecological knowledge and they'll request that. But many of our volunteer opportunities that we help get connected with, we're often really only the conduit. They aren't really volunteering for me. They're volunteering for another person who needs that service. So we sort of are the, the yenta or the matchmaker, if you will, here getting people connected. Um, so we may or may not have people who've taken the course. We always try to kind of steer them back to the course, of course because that's our bread and butter, right? I mean, I want them to come to the course, but if they get to us through volunteering first, that's okay. So that's why at the top of our chart, that arrow kind of goes back and forth because the volunteer may come in 
at a funny place and then we would still like them to receive the education. Uh, but that isn't always the case, uh, but that's how we, we try to do it. And anyone who is an adult can become a master nationalist in our state. It's a little bit different. Um, every state has their own guidelines. Not every state has a program. It's about 30, 35 states who have programs. Um, and in our situation, they pay $295 and get a course for 40 hours. Yes, we have scholarships. Uh, we did not have scholarships to begin with. And then we were uh, really appealing to the older Caucasian male crowd and found that that was really not who we wanted there only. So once we provided scholarships, our mean income went down like by half and our diversity went up a bit. We're still, we're still pretty white here in Minnesota. We're working hard to, to have that reflect our changing population. But we do have a, a fair number of women. We're about 60, 40, 60% women, 40% men. And in terms of audiences, I would say for, for my B project, the Master Naturalist group has been a helpful pool to draw from, um, but they're not exclusively my audience. And regardless of what background they have, um, everyone gets the same training based on the protocols I want them to follow. If they're taking pictures on iNaturalist, they just have to know how to use iNaturalist. Um, but if they're out in the field collecting bumblebees, then I ask if they've gone through a bumblebee species level ID training with me. But I can guarantee that they're um, reporting the correct data. Great. Great. Um, if there's no more questions, I'll go ahead and end the recording here. Um, yeah, thanks again to our three presenters and thanks for everyone for being on the call today. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, again, I, I don't want to curse her around and try to find you all back. Uh, oh, it's over. Okay, now we're not recording. Is that what that is?